Welcome to another edition of Teach the Geek Interviews. My name is Neil Thompson. I'm the founder of Teach the Geek. I work with technical professionals so they can present more effectively, especially in front of non-technical audiences. And you can learn more about that at teachthegeek.com. Again, that's teachthegeek.com. If you're watching this on YouTube, remember to subscribe and, and like the video. And if you're listening to the podcast, a review would always be appreciated. Today, my guest is Janice Litvin. She works with companies to help com to help employees manage burnout. She's a speaker and author too. Her book, Banish Burn It Banish Burnout Toolkit, the book meant to help readers better handle stressors. So, how did a math major end up a burnout expert? Well, let's let's dive in to find out. Welcome to Teach the Geek Interviews, Janice. Thank you so much for having me. I'm delighted to be here, Neil. So, I mentioned in the intro that you actually studied math. So, what was the motivation to to do that? Well, it's a funny story. Um, back when I was going to college, my mother ironically had been a recruiter. And I say ironically because eventually I became a recruiter sort of by accident. And she, and this was down in Houston in the oil and gas industry. And she said, you know, a woman with a technical degree will never have trouble finding a job. So I think, and I had, a, I liked math and computers. And she said, I think you should become a computer programmer. So the, my whole motivation was to become independent and self-sufficient and be able to, you know, uh, move away from home and go out on my own and be successful as a thriving, self-sufficient adult. And so I majored in math because at the time I went to University of Texas, there was no computer science degree. So I majored in math with the goal of becoming a computer programmer. Did you ever become one? Yes. Oh, yeah. Right out of college. Oh, okay. So what was that like being a computer programmer? Well, uh, there are pros and cons and it really depends on your personality and your style of communication, communication and working. I loved the environment. I love the other people around me. They all had been recent college graduates and I've, and I really enjoyed that aspect of it, but I found out that I didn't love computer programming as much as I thought I would especially in the environment of a bank. I worked for a large bank. And um, <clears throat> so uh, eventually what I found out that I really loved to do was talking to the people. So eventually I did software support. And then after that, some training. Oh, okay. What was that transition like? Was it, was it an easy or, or a difficult transition to make? <clears throat> well, within the context of the job I had, um, well, it took, first of all, it took me a while to come to that conclusion. After Bank of America, I went to a software company called Computer Sciences Corporation, where my job was software consulting. So it took me finding another job to find that. That position didn't really exist at Bank of America. And so I went to Computer Sciences, where that was the position I was hired into. And so I really loved going out, seeing clients helping them choose software, installing software, and supporting software. Right now, a lot of people are being laid off, Janice. And when during this whole layoff, they may be thinking about making a, a transition to something else. It sounded like you went from, because you went from computer programming to support and then even to training, that was a transition that you made all, the, all those years ago. For the people who are listening or watching this conversation, what advice would you have for making a, a transition? The best thing <clears throat> I can advise is to call, uh, pick up the phone and call every single person you know in the world around you. And that might be uh, a friend from church who has a cousin or a partner who works in the world that you want to enter and let them know what your intentions are. Let them know where you've been, you know, in one sentence, where you've been, what you've done and where you want to go. And the other thing, uh, Neil and I were just talking uh, before we started recording about LinkedIn. I'm sure many of you are using LinkedIn. Reach out to all, 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 all your connections. DM them and say, by the way, I wanted to let you know I'm looking. If you hear of anything or you know of anybody I could even network with or have an informational interview with, I would appreciate it. And people do like to help their friends and peers. Yeah, I think you're right about that. Actually, earlier this week, I went to an event and it was geared towards job seekers. I'm not a job seeker, but I went anyway because it was fairly close to where I live. So I didn't have to drive very far. So yeah. I, I went and because I was really curious, actually, as to 
all, what all these people who are losing their jobs, especially in the tech industry, are doing to find new ones. And it was actually rather surprising how few of them have networks that they can access to even ask about jobs because so many of them who, who had been working at their companies maybe 10 plus years, they they didn't really build up that sort of network that so that they could go to them and ask them, well, do you, do you have any openings at your current employer? Or do you know anybody who is hiring? So, so many of them are going on LinkedIn and applying for you know, hundreds of jobs at a time. And I just think how, how effective a strategy that is, especially now with so many people out of work, that job that you're applying for, probably hundreds of people are applying for that job too. I have so many responses to that, but I thought of two. Number one, while you're still at a company, before there's a layoff, try to join other employee groups. Try to get involved with wellness events with groups like uh, the AIDS Walk or the Heart Walk. Join your employee resource groups. If you're with a very large organization, there's a very good chance there's an employee resource group known as an ERG. And some companies have 10 or 20. There are Latinx, LGBTQ, Black employees, all kinds of tech geeks. I mean, there are all kinds of groups within inside companies. And then you meet people from other departments and you build your network, as Neil is referring to. The other thing is a lot of jobs, which are not software development jobs, require a technical background, like recruiting, like training, like sales support like um, other kinds of support jobs and customer service jobs, if you have a tech background and you're struggling, branch out and and focus in on the kind of personality you have. I was outgoing and I realized that with programming, you really had to be focused and keep your head down where I was more outgoing and liked being with people. Of course, you want to use what your skill set is. And one more thing I thought of, if your company is providing any kind of outplacement services, take advantage of them because number one, they know how to write a resume and they know how to help you network and they know companies, they know people all over the place. So if you don't have a network, ask them if you can expand on their network and don't forget the value of informational interviews. There's less pressure on you and less pressure on the person you're speaking to. When you talk about an informational interview, what is that? That's where you go to a company. Like let, Let's say I met somebody at uh, my church or synagogue, and I know that their partner is a muckety-muck at Google. Based on your relationship, it's okay to say, is there any way your partner would be okay uh, if I could buy him, a, him or her a cup of coffee on the weekend or during the week or whenever it's convenient. I just want to ask a few questions about uh, working at Google and, and some job goals I have in mind. Pe like I said, people like to help other people. And don't forget that people care about you, even though this seems like a kind of a crazy world we're living in right now, political divisiveness, and all kinds of other environmental issues, but people down deep really like helping other people. Yeah, I think you're right. And what really struck, what stands out to me, two people that I can think of who lost their jobs and they had new jobs in a month. So they basically missed a couple of pay periods. So they, 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 they weren't all that affected. And I highly suspect that they got these new jobs, not by going online and applying for a bunch of jobs. They tapped right. into their network Right. And they got jobs very quickly. I've actually suggested to both of them that they should write a post on or a, an article yes. on LinkedIn yes. on what they did to, yes. to get those jobs so quickly. But I don't yes. think either of them have, have taken me up on that yet. So let me say this. I was a recruiter for 20 years. And um, don't discount the federal government. The federal government is hiring people. The federal government is hiring. Go to USAjobs. I believe it's USAjobs.gov. And it's a slow and tedious process. And I know it seems like no one out there is responding, but try to do your follow-up best you can. And by the way, speaking of follow-up, when you do, I know a lot of you are applying for a lot of jobs that you're finding, try to figure out, and this is tricky, but put on your detective hat and try to figure out who somebody that works at the company you're looking at, if, whether they're a recruiter in HR or they're a, a tech hiring manager, and start to connect with them and say, by the way, I just uh, applied for a job at your company. Is there any way you can help me follow up? 
it's been a couple of weeks and I, I'd really, oh, I'm sorry, interrupted myself. Don't forget the value of a cover letter. And if you need help with a cover letter, there are many samples out there. Please, please, please write a cover letter. It shows the company that you care and it'll put you head and shoulders above the people that are not writing cover letters. Interesting. Because I've heard other people say that no one reads the cover letter because even with the resume, they'll look at the resume for a few seconds. So if they're not even looking at the resume that 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 thoroughly, how thoroughly are they going to look at the cover letter? But it sounds like you say still do the cover letter. In the software system that where they're receiving the information, they can see that you wrote a cover letter. Whether they read the detail of the cover letter or not, they can see that one is sitting there. And so that makes you, that alone makes you stand out. And speaking of the resume, you have five seconds to attract their attention. So don't just write, I did this and I did this and I did this and I did this. Number one, use action verbs. And number two, think in terms of major accomplishments. At the top of the resume, do not use an objective statement that says, my goal is to, et cetera, et cetera. Put the job title you're applying for and do a short skill summary segment with some uh, keywords, like hashtag keywords, that describe how you're a fit. And that section can be customized for every job you're applying for. Nice. So Janice, you started off as a computer programmer out of college. You worked in support. You worked in training. You you worked as a recruiter. But now you're a burnout expert. So well, <laughs> how'd you come to be a burnout expert? I knew you were going to ask me that question. Well, that's a long story, and I'll try to make it succinct. So in, as you all know, in 2008, we had a horrible recession, and there were no jobs. So there was no work for recruiters, and I had to figure out something else to do. And my entire life, I had never been stuck about what I wanted to do. I always had a goal. But at this moment in my life, I was completely stumped. I didn't know what I wanted to do. At that time, my son was in high school, so I decided... If I had nothing else to do, I should go to the gym because I had gotten out of shape from working so hard and I needed to get back in shape. So I put on my gym clothes every morning, dropped my son off at school, went to the gym and found Zumba Fitness. This was in 2008, 2009. I became a Zumba instructor in 2009, still teaching Zumba today for fun on Zoom, if you can believe it. And through that circuitous route, I just, I rediscovered my love of presenting myself publicly. And I wanted to help other people figure out that being healthy and fit is the underpinning of your whole life, whether you're a job seeker or anybody else. It's like brushing your teeth. If you don't move your body, your body will rebel. And so I got very um, engaged in the whole world of fitness. I went to the American Heart Association and I volunteered to speak for them about heart health. And one day a client called me and said, we want you to do a talk about stress, but we don't want you to talk about mindfulness or meditation or any of those things. We want you to go deeper. And I had already been doing some research from the uh, American Psychological Association. And I came up with this program that I now call Banish Burnout. Okay. You know, I probably should have asked this first, but what is burnout? Oh, my goodness. Well, literally, well, there are actually there are two definitions. The literal definition of burnout or the little literal description is when someone completely, completely gets exhausted emotionally, physically and mentally, and they need to take a complete break from everything. And they really can only do things like walk on the beach and read and watch funny movies and listen to soft music and rest. That's all you can do. But the World Health Organization in 2019 declared burnout an illness, which was defined by chronic workplace stress that had not been successfully managed. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. I got it. I got it. So I, I know you also, I mean, I mentioned in the, in the intro that you wrote a book, what was the motivation for you writing the book and what do you hope people get from it? Well, thank you. I held the book up while you were introducing. I don't know if you saw me. I'll hold it up one more time. Banish Burnout Toolkit. And by the way, you can all download a free chapter, which I'll tell you later. Uh, the motivation for writing the book was that I wanted people to understand that stress is not just about meditation and health and ex and uh, healthy eating and exercise, which are all important. 
but it's also about your mind and the fact that you can change the way you react to stress. Now, there's nothing you can do about a toxic workplace except try to um, come in with as positive an attitude as you can and get your work done and maybe work from home. But other than that, you want to um, control when possible the way you react. You can't control the things around you. And there's always a stressor, traffic, an annoying neighbor, somebody's dog is barking, or there's a lot of pressure from work. You can't change those things. You can only change yourself. And so that is the underpinning of my whole book, teaching people how to change their reactions. And also uh, a highlight of the book is setting healthy boundaries. Uh, I think that's a, that's a great message because ultimately you only control yourself. You don't control what's going on out you know, around you. And so right. fi figuring out the best way to, re to react to certain situations, hey, that's, that's all within your control as opposed right. to telling other people what they need to do on your behalf because they may they may do it or, or they may not <laughs> right agree. or they may not agree with you yeah that that too you know when i first started the the podcast and the and the youtube channel janice it all stemmed from my own struggles giving presentations in front of people working as an engineer in the medical device industry and i noticed that a lot of the other engineers they weren't all that much better at it than i was but i certainly saw the importance of getting better at it because my project that i was brought into a company to do was canceled that was the the that was the the catalyst that I needed to to really get better at presenting whatever I knew to people who didn't know what I what I knew. So so I'm so I'm curious to to hear your story on I guess when did you see the benefit of being adept at presenting in front of others and public speaking in general? Interestingly, when I was twelve, my mother said, and she's. She took each of us, there were four of us, she took each of us at the same age and said, you are going to learn how to be able to present yourself in front of other people. It's one of the most important life skills, whether you're an introvert or an extrovert, it can be done. And um, and so she entered me, or she told me to enter a seventh grade speech contest, which I did not win, but the winning was in the process of learning how to stand up in front of a group. And yes, there's gonna be jitters. Yes, there's gonna be butterflies in your stomach, but there are ways to get over those. And as soon as you get the first words out, you begin to calm down with deep, you know, and there are things I do before I present as well to help me, but the nerves are actually, can be used positively as energy so that you will appear more enthusiastic on stage. Absolutely. When it comes to the, the presentations that you do, Janice, do you have a process for putting them together? And if so, what is it? Do I have a process for putting them together? Absolutely. Um, that, let's, let me see if I can answer this succinctly. It really depends. Well, the very first thing I do is I talk to my client and I ask them lots and lots and lots of questions about who the audience is specifically, demographic, job type, uh, age range, what are they looking for? What are their problems? And what, why, why do they see me as a fit? And then I actually ask the client if I can speak to three to six of the people who will be in the audience so I can get more intimate with what they're looking for. And then I customize every presentation. I have a basic layout for my burnout presentation, but I customize different parts of it and including the different stories I tell so that it makes more sense to them. And I engage them and include them physically and verbally as much as I can throughout the presentation. When it comes to the, the presentations that you give on burnout, I suspect that they they last for a certain amount of time. Is there, are there other things that you offer the organizations that you work with so that they can delve deeper into addressing their burnout issues? Absolutely. And that, that's actually a beautiful question. Thank you, Neil. Yes, I do. I go in and help. I consult with large organizations to assess and understand what's going on with an organization. Sometimes it's not the employees. Sometimes it's the managers that might need emotional intelligence training or some kind of project manager. You know, people, is, and this is especially true in tech, so you'll relate to this, Neil. Have you ever known a technical person that got promoted because they were super smart technically, 100%. but didn't have, didn't have the emotional intelligence. Oh, yeah. So we, we find a lot of that. So I go in and assess the situation, assess the employees and the managers and try to, and, and the overall culture 
to see what might be underlying the organization and try to advise that way. Some is it, some of it is workshops, some of it is small group coaching. Yeah, I mean, it's so unfortunate that companies that you think would know better would know that just because you are technically adept at your job doesn't mean that you have the skills to manage other people. Those are two totally different scenarios to be in. And you definitely have to have emotional intelligence to manage people. I'm, one of the reasons I never wanted to be a manager of people is because I didn't want to deal with people's neuroses. People are nuts. You know, all, all, and, and they want you to have to help them come, you know, get through their problems. It's like, I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm not Dr. Phil. You need, you need, you need serious help. But yet they're coming to you, and 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 your and your results are based on their results. So you you have to help them in some way. You have to figure it out, help them or help them figure it out. And a lot of right. times these people are not equipped, and the companies don't do a very good job of equipping them with the, with the right. I guess the tools that they need to be effective right. managers. But hey, you were really good at your job, so you're going to manage people now. It's like, right? What? <laughs> yeah, it's a like you say, it's a completely different skill set. When someone is identified as a potential for management, they should go for a whole battery of training. And like you say, if there is an employee that really needs extreme help, at least teach the manager what tools to provide them to get the help they need. Because yes, the manager is a big brother or sister or a psychologist or a best friend. I mean, they're well, at least we hope they are. They're not all. <laughs> <laughs> you know actually i mentioned the the event that i went to earlier this week and one of the speakers was talking about making the transition from being an employee to being an entrepreneur he's been an entrepreneur for about 30 years now and one of the questions i had asked him had to do with being a leader and being vulnerable and mm -hmm. I, I i asked him how important it is for a leader to be vulnerable because he had said earlier in his presentation that there are certain things you can't share with your with your with your the people that report to you with your direct reports. So mm -hmm. I was curious as to where vulnerability fell in that, given that there are certain things that you can't share with your direct reports. What do you think about that? That's a really, really, really smart question, Neil. Um, so as you all know, Brene Brown talks a lot about vulnerability as a strength, not a weakness. Of course, there are certain things you can't share about maybe the organization but you can talk about yourself and your own vulnerabilities. For example, Prudential years ago started a program where the leaders talked about their vulnerabilities. One man who was the chief medical officer at the time, his wife had committed suicide and he was really struggling as you can imagine. And he was a, a C-suite person. And But um, his uh, coworkers uh, right around him started to notice that he was struggling. And they said, well, what's going on with you? And so because he shared with the people around him what was happening, he felt stronger and more validated. And the people around him could be more uh, cognizant of what was going on and then more patient with what he was going through. And when one person shares vulnerability, the people around them will also share the vulnerability, kind of like mirror neurons. You know, when you smile at someone, they smile back. When you share something personal, it opens the door for others to share their personality as well. That's interesting because I actually had a conversation with someone after the presentation and I mentioned the idea of a, a leader sharing with his or her direct reports that they are suffering through imposter syndrome. I'm not sure that I can lead this group. I'm not sure I, everyone's going to find me out as a fraud. But then I thought to myself, is that something you really want to share with your direct reports? The, the fact that you're not sure whether you could lead them, then they, they, they might think that if you don't think you can lead us, well, maybe you can't. <laughs> why, why should we right. think you can? So, so that's why it got me thinking about vulnerability and, and how vulnerable you want to be with your direct reports. I mean, is there a, any sort of threshold, that type of thing? Well, you brought up something that's very important to make a note of, and that is imposter syndrome. A lot of people go through imposter syndrome, especially at the time of a promotion. So we can't discount it. That doesn't mean we have to share with our direct reports, hey, I don't know if I can lead. That might make them feel uncomfortable. But we can certainly seek advice from our peers and saying, or, or other people that we're, that we're friendly with outside the organization and saying, have, have any of you ever felt imposter syndrome? 
it's not um it's not something to be swept under the carpet i mean it's a real fear but that doesn't mean we can't be the person we're meant to be we just have to go deep within and find that strength within ourselves and it helps to talk to a coach you know i i i take your point where maybe it is better to share with peers not with your direct reports or right. people from outside the organization because you know, you want your direct reports to think that you are competent and that you're capable of leading them. And, you know, there, there likely is a, a threshold is like there's there's TMI, too much information, something you need to keep, keep to yourself. At least don't share them with your with your direct reports. That's for sure. I mean, Janice, you mentioned earlier the the idea of feeling butterflies and and, you know, feeling nervous before you give a presentation. So I suspect that's something that that you that you experience. And, and if you do, what do you do to relieve those nerves? Well, first of all, I have to tell you something. If I ever am approaching a presentation like it's an hour before and I don't feel butterflies, that's when I get nervous because that means I'm not pumped up enough. So, but, but I remember one presentation in particular where I was speaking in front of one of my very revered mentors in the public speaking world. Her name's Patricia Fripp. If anybody, by the way, speaking of Patricia Fripp, if anybody wants to learn how to perfect their skills, whether you have to present in a meeting to management or become a stage speaker, go to fripp.com or frippvt.com. And I didn't plan this plug, but one day she had invited me to speak for a business group in San Francisco several years ago. And I was a nervous wreck that morning. My throat felt like sandpaper. My heart was pounding out of my chest. And so I went into the back room where no one could see me. And I actually did jumping jacks. And I did a lot of jumping jacks and a lot of deep breathing and more jumping jacks for about 10 or 15 minutes. I was breathing and jumping and breathing and jumping and deep breathing and drinking warm tea. And that that really helped. And the biggest thing about getting on stage is the first words out of your mouth. If you can spit out the first couple of sentences, the nerves go away. And that's what I think a lot of people who have a fear of speaking don't realize. You're not afraid the whole time. It's just the first few words. So if you memorize the first two or three sentences and you don't have to memorize a speech, you just have to remember the bullet points and maybe the vignettes that you wanna tell and what key business points you wanna make, but you don't have to memorize a speech, just the first few sentences. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan of not memorizing speeches too because it comes off as robotic. And if you forget a word, then it kind of throws you into a tailspin as to what comes next, too. And I, I really enjoyed this conversation, Janice. Thank you so much for being a guest. How can people get in touch with you? Well, um, I assume in the show notes, you'll have my name spelled JaniceLitvin.com. So my website is JaniceLitvin.com. My email is Janice at JaniceLitvin.com. And my book, which you can download a free chapter is JaniceLitvin.com slash book and scroll down to the bottom and you'll find a place to download a free chapter. Excellent. Well, everyone, that marks the end of another edition of Teach the Geek interviews. My name is Neil Thompson. I'm the founder of Teach the Geek. I work with technical professionals so they can present more effectively, especially in front of non-technical audiences. And you can learn more about that at TeachTheGeek.com. Again, that's TeachTheGeek.com. Until next time, take care and stay safe. Thanks, Janice. Thank you so much for having me, Neil. I really enjoyed it.